A new season of Fanatec GT World Challenge America, powered by AWS, begins today. One of the top road courses in North America. Many of the top GT3 teams and drivers have assembled to take on the challenge of a brand new season that begins in Northern California wine country. This is Sonoma Raceway. That is the grid of drivers that will be challenging each other for race wins and the championship across the 2023 season. What is absolutely official, the first race of the Fanatec GT World Challenge powered by AWS season is absolutely here. We are at Sonoma Raceway protected by CrowdStrike. And as you can see, the work on this GT machinery is already getting underway behind me. There are so many incredible storylines heading into this weekend. The new cars on the grid, seven different manufacturers. We have a Ferrari 296 in the new Porsche format as as well and all of these guys are getting ready to go as you can see one of the drivers about to get in car now but what did the 12 turns around Sonoma Raceway look like let's take a look at our Fanatec track preview hi my name is Stephen McAleer I'm gonna take you around a lap of Sonoma the Fanatec track preview this will be in our GT3R Rensport 1 Community Beer Works Porsche. Great fun around place in Sonoma. So we're going to come across start and finish line here. We'll be turning in flat out in fifth gear up the hill, working the arrow in here. Just as we get to the yellow line and pit out, start our braking. Down three gears, down to second. A little bit understeer right in the center there, using the trash control back to power, up to third gear. Using a compression on the left-hander here, mid-track, we'll lose the front again, right in the center, quite hard to see over the top of the hill. Hard braking, really hard to get the car down to that apex, again in the TC, back to full power. If the car's handling good, it should be full speed through here, coming up over the blind crest for the carousel. Uh, a little bit more speed in there for the next time around, that's uh, still working in there, so keeping our momentum, back to power at the end of the curving on the left all the way down into turn seven, up to fifth gear. Really bumpy braking zone in here, very easy to overdo it. Hard braking, down into second, cross over the white line, hopefully they'll get me into trouble for that. Second brake, back to power. We're gonna be full speed all the way through the S's here. It was a little damp this morning. Tiny brush of the brakes on the left-hander. Again, just working in the arrow here, should be flat through this right-hander, still some work to do there. Hard braking at the two and a quarter board right down into first gear, using the curb on the right, up over the curb on the left, back to power. Goal is to get through this right-hander full speed, which is quite easy right now. Heading up to the last corner, we're gonna try and get to that first cone, separating pits and the track, back to braking, down into second gear, down into first, patience, and back to power, go, go, go. There's a lap around Sonoma. 12 turns, two and a half miles in length, and nearly 160 feet of elevation change around this phenomenal racetrack, Sonoma Raceway, here in Northern California. It is the start of a brand new season, and as always, so many unknowns when you unveil a new campaign. Earlier this weekend, our Amanda Busick took a walk around the paddock and gives us an idea of what to watch for. We're in the garage for a brand new season of the Fanatec GT World Challenge Series right here at Sonoma Raceway. We have 18 cars this weekend that are going to take to the 12-turn track here with seven manufacturers represented. There are five cars racing in the pro category, including this 93 Acura of Racer's Edge. Your Pro-Am reigning champions are moving to the pro category and they'll see if they can get Racer's Edge their fourth championship in five seasons. And speaking of the seven manufacturers represented here this weekend, the Ferrari 296 is making its SRO global debut here at Sonoma. This one specifically driven by Manny Franco and Alessandro Balzan, who made an impressive debut last year at Sebring. They're going to try to stop that 93 Racer's Edge from that pro championship. 
12 cars are set to battle in the Pro-Am category this season, including the runner-up from last year, the duo of Charlie Luck and Jan Halen, who happens to be with us here in the garage right now. This is the brand new Porsche 911 GT3R for this season. But Wright Motorsports is actually going to have two Porsches on track this year as well as Elliott Skier and Adam Adelson join us from Pirelli GT4. When you think of the battle in Pro-Am and you think of who is going to be in that championship contention, you have to look no other than right here by the crowd strike entry of George Kurtz and Colin Brown. These guys have raced together for many years and we know how dynamic George can be on tracks just like Sonoma Raceway protected by crowd strike. Thank you very much, Amanda. It is a great view of this grid, which through the magic of television has been transported down pit side, and that's where our Amanda Busick is standing by with Calvin Fish. I have absolutely robbed you of your booth uh, mate at the moment. Calvin Fish on the grid here with me, but Ryan, I'll deliver him back up to you soon after we talk about what has already happened here in Sonoma. We heard about the storylines, but qualifying was unpredictable. What stood out to you? Well, coming in into any new ex season, it's very exciting, Amanda. So many unknowns. How would the new cars perform? The Porsche and the Ferrari. New driver lineups, and boy, what a surprise in qualifying this morning. We're looking at two guys on their Fanatec GT debut sitting on the front row. Eric Filgaris really put in a tremendous lap there. There was an abbreviated session. He had the poise to just sit back there, nail a lap right at the death there, and just put in a great performance to start from the pole position. They're used to winning. He and McAleer won 11 races on the way to the GT4 championship last year, but this is a different level and they're stacked up really nicely here today. I was talking to Steven prior to getting this race started and he said that Eric was so nervous as he was right. looking at data, just trying to keep his mind busy. And Cal, we've heard drivers describe this place as tricky. There are blind curves, right. there's elevation changes. How does one find success here? Well, certainly the front row have found the speed. Now it's about execution in this race today. There's going to be a pit stop window 40 minutes in. you really got to be careful with that one. You want, don't want to get caught out. There's some new procedures. If it goes yellow during that time, there's a risk there. But the AMs are starting the car, so you'd expect that the teams want to get the AMs out, get the pros in, maximize their drive time today. So look for that. But it's a tricky racetrack. It's low grip. Cars will be sliding around towards the end of the stint. Managing the tires will be a key to victory here today. Well, I know I better deliver you back up to our teammate, Ryan Marine. Thank you for the insight on grid, Cal. It's going to be fun. <laughs> Thank you very much, Amanda. And it's a great grid of cars behind you. So much excitement about this car, though. The brand new GT3 offering from Ferrari after so many years of the 488 through several different evolutions, the 296 has arrived and certainly some changes with it. Gone is the Turbo V8. It's now a Turbo V6 powering the prancing horse, but certainly one of the cars that has drawn the most fan attention here at the racetrack throughout the course of the weekend. Stephen McAleer earlier today gave us a view on that Fanatec track preview, but let's look at this track layout here. Two and a half miles, 12 turns, nearly 15 stories of elevation change. That's from the top of the hill in turn three down to turn 10, the lowest point on this racetrack. A challenging racetrack for sure. And as you look at this track map, it's very clear. Look for a straightaway. It's hard to find one. No place to rest around Sonoma Raceway. These are not super long stints in Fanatec GT, but that said, it could be a real challenge physically, especially in these high downforce GT3 cars. Back grid side with Amanda. Well, as we know, these are the best words that drivers want to hear, and that means we are officially ready to go from CrowdStrike. We have the CLO and the CMO with the word. Drivers, start your engines! Thanks to Jennifer and Kathleen getting our field roaring to life. And now they head out onto the track for the first of two formation laps. Get the 2023 season underway. Great mix of GT3 cars as ever. Huge though, Mercedes contingent this weekend. Certainly one thing to keep an eye on. A couple of Porsche 911s on the front row, but interestingly, they are two different variations of that 911 GT3R. Eric Vilgaris on the overall pole. That is in the newest of those Porsche 911s based on the 992 platform. Adam Adelson will start alongside for Wright Motorsports in a previous generation of that 911 race car, but both awfully quick. 
leading this field as they will on the front row. And those are your Rova pole sitters as well in their respective classes. Eric Filgaris in his GT3 debut stormed to pole position earlier this morning. If you weren't with us for qualifying, it was impressive stuff. There was a red flag midway through the session, which meant that it was just one quick dash to try and put in a fast lap. And Filgaris did exactly that to claim the Rova pole award. He'll have Adam Adelson starting alongside on Pro-Am pole. Then we go back to row number two where George Kurtz, who came so close to a championship one year ago, he lines up alongside Chandler Hall, already a champion this year in Asian Le Mans competition. Back to row three, Seth Lucas, a class winner at the Indianapolis eight hour last year. We'll have series veteran James Safronis, over 300 starts in this championship to his credit, starting alongside. Then we go back a little bit further where we find Samantha Tan, newly minted brand ambassador for BMW, rolling off in the Pro-Am class entry from S3 Racing. Will Hardeman and the S's Racing team, which is making its debut this weekend. Nice qualifying effort for Will with a team that's still finding its sea legs at this level of competition. A little further back, we find Charlie Luck, also one of those contenders for the Pro-Am title last year. He shares that Wright Motorsports Porsche with his father-in-law, Jan Halen, and Manny Franco, who was so impressive on debut at Sebring one year ago. Back to the next row where we find Jeff Burton. New home for Jeff this year. DXDT racing. He's in a Mercedes after a year in Lamborghinis. Scott Smithson, his teammate from DXDT, starting alongside. Then a little further back, 13th and 14th, Pedro Torres, a series debutant. He'll share that ACI Motorsport Porsche with Spencer Pompelli. And Ashton Harrison mired much further back than we anticipated. Her pro class debut after a Pro-Am championship last year. A spicy qualifying session earlier today has her mired deep in traffic. Ziad Gondor driving a Mercedes this year, but reunited with TR3 Racing. He starts 15th, and Derek DeBoer making his GT3 debut in this championship starts 16th. Then in the final row, we find Justin Wetherill and Anthony Bartone, each of whom had their share of problems in qualifying this morning. A relatively harmless spin for Bartone cost him a chance to turn in a lap time in Q1, and his teammate, Andy Pilgrim, a chance to turn in a lap time in Q2. Well, lights are off on the safety car, or are about to be. This is the second of two formation laps, and after making a mad dash up here to our broadcast position, Calvin Fish has the headset back on. You were down there on the grid, Calvin. What was the atmosphere like? Well, I think excitement, anticipation. Uh, first race of the championship season. Everyone wants to get off to a clean start, but you've got two drivers on the front of this grid, as we mentioned, Ryan, that do not have experience leading a field like this. So the pressure is on, but I think both of them have the credentials and the pedigree to deal with it. But you know there's going to be drivers a little bit deep in the field right now going to be making some early moves. My eye, for one, is on Ashton Harrison. As mentioned, she and Chandler Hull basically had a race going yeah. <laughs> in qualifying this morning. It really cost her a chance at a good quality lap. It did. I did have a chance to have a quick chat with John Meraki just a few minutes ago, the uh, team manager and uh, team owner there at Race's Edge, and he said, yeah, we just uh, it was an experience thing. She shouldn't have got in that little battle there. It cost her dearly. We have a much faster race car than the uh, qualifying position proved so they've got a bit of work to do making that jump up to the pro class they want to follow up on a pro-am championship from 2022 one final time behind the toyota gr supra safety car the official vehicle of sro america for this field of 18 cars led by eric filgaris first time racing in gt3 of course the co-champion alongside his teammate Stephen McAleer in Pirelli GT4 America Silver Class competition a year ago where they smoked the field. Figured it would be a bit of an adjustment before they'd show that kind of pace. The team is new to GT3 racing. Well, any concern of that was not well founded whatsoever. As we learned this morning in qualifying, Eric Filgaris was really quick. Yeah, all the ingredients were there for getting it wrong and he got it right, so that was even uh, more icing on the cake there. Pair of Porsches on the front row, Filgaris to the left of the screen, Adelson to the right. Second row, George Kurtz and Chandler Hull behind them, Lucas and Zafronis. The field in rows of two, approaching turn 12 and entering the VP Racing Acceleration Zone waiting for that green flag to start the 2023 season and we're underway at Sonoma. Great start there by Phil Garris. 
Now you see Adelson there, he's on the outside, there's no grip there. Can Chandler Hull take advantage? No, he doesn't. That's the white BMW of Chandler Hull. George Kurt slots in in the fourth position. Adelson had the benefit of running the GT America race earlier today. He's been in this position already once, and he put those lessons to work. He runs in the second spot behind Phil Garris, then Hull, then Kurtz, then Sophronis. That's your top five. Ball moved down to the inside there by Seth Lucas aboard the number 53. MDK and problems here early for Smithson. And we know it is wet off the racing surface. There's been a lot of rain in this area over the last several weeks. Certainly true earlier this week as well. Some cars that have gotten off track have been stuck, but it did look like Smithson might be able to rejoin. At the front of the field, it continues to be Phil Garris showing the way. Let's not forget a handful of these drivers in this uh, starting lineup did have uh, track time earlier. Ball moved down the inside. That's Charlie Luck inside of Samantha Tan. I think Jeff Burton goes with him. Indeed, Samantha Tan caught out a little bit. Now forced three wide. She drops a few more spots. So struggling to find the speed here on the opening lap for Samantha Tan at the ST Racing BMW M4. Yeah, very much out of a rhythm right now. They've got to get it back together here. They have a very fast race car. She qualified well and her teammate John Edwards qualified on the pole for race two here this weekend. Into the heavy braking zone for the chicane. That's turn nine. Quick right, then a left, then this sweeper that's turned 10 into the heavy braking zone, the hairpin of turn 11. Nice clean opening lap other than Smithson's little bobble now, so the tire temperatures and pressures will gradually start to increase to get into their sweet spot. Great start here by Eric Filgaris. First racing lap in a GT3 car and he leads it. Eric Filgaris, the young man, Adelson out in wide front. Again. And that allows... in the middle of the road there, there's gray and there's not the grip there, and Chandler Hull is going to take advantage of this and slide his BMW up to P2. Hull is one of those that has been promoted to the pro class this year after campaigning in Pro-Am the last couple of seasons, and he feels ready for the challenge. Had a big workout regimen in the offseason. He looks like a different guy. He's really ready to go here in 2023. Yeah, his teammate and mentor is uh, Bill Orblin, one of the winningest sports car drivers ever, and uh, he certainly will have got Chandler tuned up and recognized that every facet of your, your build and everything that you do to prepare for these race weekends is so, so important. And John has certainly taken that message well. Very fit young man now and uh, ready to go. George Kurt starting to apply some pressure to Adelson who slipped that spot a little bit further back. The pass by Hull though, crucially, that is not for class position. That was out of class there, a pro class car making his way through the Pro-Am leader. But what that does now is it brings the top three in Pro-Am all together with Adelson, Kurtz, and Zafronis. It does. Kurtz looked like he settled into this race very nicely. James Zafronis aboard the Audi. So Audi in this field, sharing that car with Tom Dyer. Right on board here with George Kurtz. Adelson right in front, running P3. Leader in Pro-Am is Adelson right now. Sophronis gave that Evo version of the Audi its North American debut on the streets of St. Petersburg about a month or so ago in GT America powered by AWS competition. Here we have three different German GT3 manufacturers battling it out for the lead in Pro-Am. Yeah, this is so cool. Looks like Kurtz's car is really carving these corners nicely. Looks very settled in the early going here. Sophronis had brake issues at St. Pete and made some brake cooling adjustments. Jeff Burton off early in this race. Not a great start for DXDT. Both their cars off in the weeds early. Smithson, the team car, Uriah Cal had the issues on the opening lap. It was a disastrous weekend at St. Pete for Jeff Burton. Some heavy damage to his car, didn't get to race. Now with an early issue in the first Fanatec GT event of the season. This is the tail end of how it happened and he caught that tire wall pretty hard. He did. He's climbing the hill up there through turn one towards turn two car is still stationary at this point. Might need an intervention to get that car out of the mud at the top of the hill. Yeah, they'll, the stewards will be in communication with the team trying to identify if that car is able to move. They'll wait a little bit longer. Car's now into turn nine and he's stationary up in turn one, turn two area, so they've got a few more seconds to work with the safety car will cause yellow. Brings a temporary end to the proceedings, just about five minutes into this 90-minute race. Drive-through penalty, according to race control, was just issued to James Sophronis. So the third-placed car in Pro-Am 
tires not properly mounted at the scheduled time. So in the build up to the race, these tires start in tire ovens or tire warmers and you have to have them affixed to the car by a certain yeah. point. Five minutes before a uh, gentleman start, you basically have to have the tires on the car three minutes before on the deck, car on the ground. So they ran afoul of that regulation in some way. Surprising to see that from a very experienced GMG racing team. And they'll have to serve that following this safety car period. There you can see from on board with Eric Fulgaris, the safety crews up at the top of the hill, going to work to get Jeff Burton out from the mud. And hopefully the damage was not too significant. And he's able to continue, albeit way late. He's just dropped a lap to the rest of the field. There are Eric Fulgaris really off and on the power, probably two footing it in terms of one foot on the brake and the throttle at the same time, try to keep that temperature build in the wheels. Basically what you do, you basically are braking hard and driving against that, that generates brake temperature through the brake caliper into the upright, into the wheel, it keeps the uh, temperature in the tire at the same time. As you get towards the latter stages of the full course yellow, you'll then see the drivers weaving around. That's to generate a little bit of tire temp, but more importantly, to clean off the tires. If there's any pickup, you want to get those cleaned off before you get back to green flag racing. Dream debut weekend in Fanatec GT World Challenge America, powered by AWS for Eric Filgaris. Let's hear more about the weekend as it's played out with Amanda. Laps for your team and Eric at the front of that. Any assessment of performance so far? Yeah, you know, I think we're, we're looking good. Obviously, Eric did a fantastic job getting his first pole in a GT3 car, first race in a GT3 car. Uh, you know, we're going to take this uh, green flag after this restart and hopefully he can build a gap. I think this uh, we're just going to try and control the race from the front. So obviously a lot of fast drivers getting in on uh, driver two. So, uh, you know, we'll take the time right down the middle and then we'll, we'll see if I can hang on at the end. At the top of the show, Calvin Fish mentioned the bucket of wins you guys had last year in GT4. You know what Eric is capable of. What have you seen from him on restarts? Well, as I had mentioned earlier, you know, he, uh, he spends a lot of time looking at data and video. I mean, sometimes I tell him it's too much. He's overanalyzing it. Uh, he's going to be good on the restart. We've already talked about this procedure, and I think he's going to be a pretty clever off of here. Um, hopefully we get a nice jump, and uh, the guys are bugging him at RS1 to, to keep the tires up to temp. So I think we'll be good. Uh, we would certainly like the race to continue green after this last restart. Uh, give me a little bit of a buffer, and uh, we'll, we'll talk to you in an hour, an hour and a half. And just real quickly, as a guy that's been around this paddock, you know this series. When you look at the talent that is in GT3, what is the threat level in the overall championship and all the people you guys are battling with? I mean, this is no joke. I qualified P12 for tomorrow, and I'm one-tenth off of P5 or P6. So really, really tough field. Uh, you know, nobody's going to give an inch in that first group. But, you know, it's just managing expectations. There's a lot of cars around me that are not in our class. Uh, I certainly would like to win overall. I'm not here to finish 10th and first in class. But, uh, you know, we'll certainly be aware of who we're around and, uh, and like lies with, uh, with Eric out there. So we'll hopefully be there at the end, both races. Thank you. Very good driver, Stephen McAleer, and announced his presence to the world. I think if you paid attention to sports car racing in North America last year, you got a pretty good glimpse at what kind of talent Stephen has because it seemed like any series he turned up in, they were running at the front. Yeah, an amazing year. Um, obviously, he and Eric put together that championship year here in SRO, but he was a leading light in all of the championships that he competed in. So he's got a ton of experience in GT3. Admittedly, most of that in a Mercedes uh, platform versus this Porsche, but the team are used to the Porsche platform with the Cayman. This is a totally different animal with his GT3 machine, but nonetheless, I mean, he has the savvy. He knows a lot of the drivers that he's going to be up against. He talked about when the pros get in the car, it changes the dynamic, and he only qualified 12th this morning. He's the 12th fastest pro this morning admittedly only by a sniff off the first two or three rows but he knows he's up against it what he's talking about he'd like this race to run green so that eric can maintain the lead hopefully and gap a lot of those other cars so that when he gets in he's got some uh, cushion to work with this is the mud we were talking about so you saw a moment ago jeff burton in the burton lumber mercedes able to rejoin the race thanks to the safety crew he's lost two laps looks like some diffuser damage to that race car you see as well the strikes there on the diffuser there that's probably the, what's rubbing, yeah, the piece that's broken down. So I would assume they'll bring the car in, check it over. Safety is first, and uh, he's already lost a lap or two, so they're out of the mix. Two laps down. 
So what does this turn into for Jeff if the car is in a state that it can drive? Certainly you'd think he would want to get as many laps as he can. He's new to this Mercedes after several years in different makes. Yeah, you got to do 50% of, of the laps of your class leader to uh, score points. So that'll be one of the number one priorities for that team. But I think making sure the car is good, making sure it's uh, fit and healthy for tomorrow, maybe use it as a bit of a test session, particularly when Corey gets in. So don't be surprised to see them do multiple pit stops and do some adjustments here. You use it as a tuning session here. On board again with Samantha Tan, who did not have a great start to the race. We saw her stuck on the outside of turn seven. It was a three wide moment there for a little bit. And perhaps it was simply discretion being the better part of valor, or perhaps there was something amiss. It was hard to tell, but she certainly didn't seem totally comfortable with the performance of that car from the drop of the green. Yeah, and some of that will come down to how the car comes alive. I mean, um, you know, your starting pressure, tire pressure can have an effect on that, certainly. And then once you're out of your groove and you don't have the grip level to fight back, you're offline, you're in the gray, that's not where the track is at its grippiest. You've got drivers being very aggressive. You're kind of left out in the shade there a little bit, and uh, she just has to regroup now. This yellow will be good for her to reset. I'm sure the team will be talking her through it. You'd have to think that John Edwards, who's a BMW factory driver, will be on the radio as well, just trying to calm her down, just saying we've got plenty of time, just keep it clean and uh, try and rebound here. But certainly a, a great qualifying performance by both drivers here this morning. George Kurtz, Crown Strike Mercedes right there, second in Pro-Am. The Burton car has made it back, but absolutely plastered in the mud. That is ubiquitous if you get off track around this place. So much rain in this part of the country over the past few weeks to cause some problems, it has to be said, and certainly I think the cleanup in, in many respects is still underway from all of that, but it has affected us in terms of racing as well because many teams were here earlier in the week to do some testing, and it was effectively a washout on Wednesday. It was, and that's why it hurt teams like RS1 and for Eric Filgaris, who has so little seat time in this GT3 car. As I said, all of the ingredients would get it to get it wrong in qualifying. He's still learning this car, learning this car at this racetrack. So for him to put together the performance, that's what made it even more outstanding. So, um, yeah, all of the teams were affected by that. You'd have to think that the teams who, who were here last year and have a solid lineup, consistency with their platform, consistency with their driver lineup would have an edge. But gradually, that all goes away as we get deeper and deeper into the race weekend. Lights are out on the Toyota GR Super safety car, so it will be accelerating away very, very soon. And we'll see for the first time Eric Filgaris leading into the VP race in the acceleration zone on a restart, which it should be said is in a different position on the track than it is for the initial start. He'll be able to begin accelerating out of turn 11, which is this tight hairpin that he's approaching right here. On board we were with the overall leader, Eric Filgaris for RS1, their first race in Fanatec GT World Challenge America, and he steps on it. Able to build a bit of a gap over Chandler Holt, who's giving chase in the BMW right behind. The green flag waves once again at Sonoma with an hour and 16 minutes to go. It does, and as uh, Stephen McAleer alluded to, they talk this through the restart procedure, make sure he's up on the wheel early, getting the tires up to temp, maintaining as best he can under that full course yellow. But John the Hull's car looks like it's coming alive pretty quickly here. Adelson, just like we saw on the initial start, struggling just a little bit. But certainly Chandler Hull looks pretty racy here. Well, and if we're talking about everything that's new for Eric Filgaris, it's the opposite for Chandler Hull, who has raced in and won a championship in the Asian Le Mans series already this year. He's raced a couple Enduros at Daytona and Sebring, so he has plenty of seat time in a BMW M4 GT3, and he's putting that to good use, applying the pressure at the front of the field. Here is James Safronis, but keep in mind, Safronis, oh, and a spin for Charlie Luck. That's coming out of the carousel. Able to resume, but not quite sure what caused that. Yeah, I wonder if he just uh, washed a little bit wide, dropped the uh, right rear. Sometimes you can lose the car coming down the hill. I think he's further through the corner than that. Obviously in close uh, proximity with cars on this restart. Not sure if there was any contact possibly involved as well, but up front, nice clean start. Let's take a look at this. Oh, he just loses it by himself coming through the corner. Ashton's quite a way back there in the red Acura there coming through the shot right now. So just probably tires not completely prepped and uh, in their sweet spot before he committed. Falls back to the back of the pack, now 17th overall. This is Sofronis serving that drive-through penalty. Again, this is issued for not having the tires mounted at the appropriate time. I think we got a shot 
just a second ago of Seth Lucas going on the attack in the MDK Porsche. Might have been grabbing a spot, fighting with Will Hardeman, who had a great qualifying effort earlier today. Yeah, watch them come up the hill there. They come in the screen. I think uh, Lucas may have just got by him. I think I saw that Porsche just in front. Adelson and Kurtz first and second in the Pro-Am ranks. Then you drop back and find Manny Franco. Manny's in that Ferrari for Conquest Racing. Then it's Hardeman. Yeah, Hardeman's clear is actually uh, Lucas just in front of uh, Harrison there. Good little battle here. You know Ashton's going to want to try and <laughs> make up for her qualifying well, decision there where she decided to get a bit too racy, tried to defend that track position with Chandler Hull and didn't lay down a fast one when it was so important. She has because she had picked up four spots before that first yellow, just picked up two more. So she's up to eight after starting 14. That is perfect. That's exactly what they wanted from her in this opening stint. Just get Mario Farnbacher, a teammate, a little bit closer to the front end of this field so he can go and chase some drivers down. Now she finds herself in a Porsche sandwich with the youngster Seth Lucas in front and Torres making his series debut right behind. A little bit of damage perhaps, or at least maybe it's just part of the wrap, but something is flapping on the right front of that Acura. I've played this it will cover or something that's peeled back. Yes. Lower right side. Part of that Acura. Shouldn't be too costly. This is not a track that puts a huge emphasis on top speed, quite frankly. Probably of all the tracks we go to this year, this is the one where you can get away with a car that might be somewhat compromised with straight line speed. Yeah, it's more about handling here. That's what you need. You need to find the grip. Nice start here by Hardeman. This uh, S, is ra S is racing with Mercedes-Benz Austin is having a nice weekend. He's teamed up with a veteran, the Irishman, Adam Carroll. So uh, this is a nice start for those guys running up in the top six overall and in third in Pro-Am right now early. Hardeman and Carroll had never met until they showed up at the NOLA test. <laughs> hey, nice to meet you. I'm your teammate. We're going to be sharing a car this season. It's How going do you to like be a, your coffee. Right. It's going to be a partial schedule. Four races confirmed for the S's Racing Team. Possibly a fifth. But that's not 100% ironed out yet. But they've got big plans looking ahead for the future. Might be a second car as early as next year. This is Manny Franco. What a debut this young man had. He had done some GT4 racing, comes from Ferrari Challenge, although I say that as if he was there for multiple seasons. He was basically there one year, nearly won a championship, ran a couple races before that also, uh, but stepped straight into the GT3 car, the old 488 at Sebring last year, and qualified on the front row. Yeah, that was so impressive. Then he sat out in the eight hour, just really wanted to uh, kind of look at all of the drivers that Eric Bachelard put on board for that eight hour to see who he wanted to team up with. He, he was teamed up with and Alessandro Balzan at Sebring and uh, of the three drivers that Conquest had, he liked what he saw from Alessandro there. So he's his full uh, season teammate for 2023. But a nice start here, got that car up in the top five. They're on the back foot a little bit, do not have a lot of seat time with that new Ferrari 296. Right now they run third in pro, fifth overall. change in the front of the field where it's still for Filgaris leading a hole. Those two ran running nearly identical lap times, just eight thousandths of a second separating them the last time around. This fight in Pro-Am though has been a good one. Since the drop of the green, Adam Adelson started on the outside of the front row, runs third overall, but leads in the Pro-Am class with series veteran George Kurtz close in tow. George has looked really solid here in these opening laps. Haven't seen any slips, just seems to be hitting his marks. Nice and consistent. He's one of the handful of drivers who have had the benefit of uh, dual track time here today. Two qualifying sessions for the day uh, with GT America in action as well. And uh, just got off the racetrack a couple of hours ago from uh, participating in that short sprint race. So lots of track time and very much in a rhythm early here today. George will take the track time however he can get it. You were telling me he did some laps in a pretty current Formula One car over the offseason. Yeah, last year he uh, got to a lap in a Mercedes Formula One car. He went to the simulator over in Brackley in the UK. He got tuned up by Anthony Davison, one of their sim and uh, reserve drivers. And uh, then uh, Lewis Hamilton himself was uh, at Coda 
uh, to give him some laps uh, in a GT3 uh, machine uh, just to uh, do a little bit of coaching with him, see what he's up to. And then he didn't just do a handful of laps. I think he did a 30, 40 lap run and it was full on. Uh, just what a great experience. Dropping back, Will Hardeman, who Adam Carroll was simply singing the praises of the entire conversation I had with Adam earlier this weekend. And he's got really good pace for someone with relatively limited experience behind him, someone with hardly any experience, Seth Lucas, but we know he's quick. He was really good in Pirelli GT4 America last year, won his class in the Indy 8 hour, second in his class in the 24 hours of Dubai a few months ago. Seems when he turns up in a GT3 car, he brings home a trophy. Yeah, I'm really excited to see what Seth Lucas can do. I mean, we saw him in GT4 competition last year, started off with a Tory Racing running with Matt Plum, then uh, they switched to just GTA competition, had some wins there, and a very exciting young talent, just turned 17 years of age, and uh, he's with another relatively youngster, not that young, but Trent and Estep. So this is a bright new team, certainly have a big footprint with Porsches in a variety of single uh, make Porsche categories as well as this entry here in Fanatec GT. This is a pro class entry here this weekend with Seth and Trenton. So that makes this a battle for class position. The Porsche of Lucas and behind him looming large that red Acura NSX GT3 Evo from Racer's Edge Motorsports. Ashton Harrison recovering from a miserable qualifying earlier today up six spots in just 22 minutes or even less than that. And she's got blood in the water now. She sees the next spot just in front of her. Also impressed with ACI Motorsport. I mean, we talked about a lot of new combinations, new teams, new cars in the field, but ACI who run right behind Ashton right now with Torres behind the wheel. The veteran Spencer Pompelli put together a really nice qualifying performance this morning and he's excited. We saw him briefly around lunch time and uh, they're excited about their potential two of these Porsche it's from the KCMG group who have been racing these cars globally. And, uh, we've got a really sharp engineer who worked with the car before, so um, he's, a, he's a Brit, so a bit difficult to understand, but other than that, it's all good. <laughs> Welcome to my world. <laughs> Ex-KCMG engineer, interestingly enough, and it's an ex-KCMG chassis that they're using. That's the final car coming through the shot just behind Ashton Harrison here in this Acura for Racer's Edge. She's been busy, as has this team. They've already done 36 hours of racing in Florida, at Daytona and Sebring in preparation. But here is Pedro Torres, who, as mentioned, co-drives with Spencer Pompelli. And you've been around Spencer more than I have over the years, but in my limited experience, that's about as optimistic as I have ever seen him going into a race. He was all smiles. Yeah, very positive about the whole situation. I think he wasn't quite sure what to expect if they'd be able to come in here green so to speak, and uh, step up to the level. And, uh, he says, we've got a lot to learn. We're kind of drinking from a fire hose right now, but he, he really likes the engineer. He understands the car. He's come to grips with the series and the rules and the regulations very, very quickly. So they're very optimistic, and uh, Pedro's done a really nice job. Don't know much about him, but he's certainly uh, been very solid here this weekend so far. He's right on board with Samantha Tan. His T racing driver has settled into a bit of a rhythm. He's got Derek DeBoer in front of her, TRG, back in the GT3 racing ranks. They ran, at least it was a factory affiliated, if not a pure on factory effort for Aston Martin stateside in the past. So some heritage there between TRG and Aston. And that's Derek just out the windscreen. Yeah. Derek just has so much passion. Great to see him on board this. Uh, he's raced a GT3 car before many years ago at Daytona. Yep. Most of his uh, experience has been in GT4 competition, but he's excited. They got the Aston Martin factory driver, Ross Gunn, teaming up for the majority of the races. Ross has a couple of clashes that he won't be at, but for the majority of the races, he'll be here. There'll be another Aston Martin factory driver filling in when Ross is not here. Ross is on debut here at at this racetrack, he said, this is a tough one to learn quickly. So uh, they're on the back foot a little bit this weekend. Derek on the front foot at the moment, though. Ooh, Looks like he's got the pace relative to Ziad Gondor, who runs directly in front of him. That's a cool look at livery on this TR3 Mercedes. Orange on the left, gray, matte black. Not exactly sure what you want to call that, but on the other side of the race car, Ziad tends to have some pretty bright liveries on his cars, and uh, he's a big personality as well. Yeah, strange to see TR3 running a Mercedes. It is. We've seen them run uh, Italian brands typically before Ferraris and Lamborghinis, but they've found that this Mercedes platform, like a lot of these customer racing teams, 
really suits the AM driver. It's very compliant. It gives uh, builds a lot of confidence and uh, ticks all of the boxes. We see Ziad a little bit slow there coming off of turn nine. Uh, Derek had to be careful not to run over the top of him there. His ace in the hole is that his pro in this Pro-Am lineup is Daniel Morad. If you joined us for the Indy 8 hour last year, Daniel put in some remarkable stints from the back. That car that he was in at the start at the back drove through the field in his stint at the very beginning and set them up for that epic finish. Raffaele Marciello finished the deal, but uh, their win at Indianapolis very much set up by Daniel Morad. He'll be the pro. Meanwhile, Derek DeBoer, a big moment there into turn one, and he goes from the attacker to the defender just like that. Yeah, we've seen that a few times here today with the races. If you run a little bit wide there through turn one, there's not a lot of grip. you just got to give up, try and gather it up. Don't push it, otherwise you're going to be off in the weeds and going for a ride there through the apex of turn two before you know it. So uh, a nice adjustment there and recognizing that you got through there a little bit wide. Settle back in, reset here. Loving those onboard shots from ST Racing and Samantha Tan. How about right behind her, the lone M class entry in the field this weekend? Anthony Bartone, the famous Bartone drag racing family, gives way for Scott Smithson to carve up the inside. Bartone, though, crosses him right back over, and Calvin, for someone lacking in experience, as Anthony does, we saw really good racecraft out of him at St. Petersburg. This was a good example of it again. Charlie Luck slots in right behind, but yeah, you're going to learn a lot in situations like this if you're Anthony. Yeah, all three of these drivers have been through the wars a little bit today. We saw Anthony uh, this morning in qualifying having a quick spin. Smithson was off the road early, first lap of this race, and Charlie had that spin coming off the uh, carousel there turn six on that restart lap. So all of these drivers are just trying to settle back in. But up front, Phil Garris doing just like he did last year on the opening stanza, gapping the rest of this field. Admittedly, a totally different level. Such an impressive performance by this young man. Chandler Hole was closing in for a time, matching the pace of the RS1 Porsche for a time. But in recent laps, that story has changed. And Chandler Hole now finds himself 2.6 seconds adrift with just over an hour to go. What's so impressive is to see Eric finally get his shot. I mean, I've known Eric for a number of years. He and his dad would just pound the pavement in the paddocks when he didn't have a ride. He was racing go-karts and just trying to find anything with uh, an engine and four wheels that he could climb aboard. But he was always super nice, just networking and uh, saying all the right things, making friends. And uh, finally, he's got this opportunity. Community Bearwogs have jumped on board big time supporting him. And uh, they're doing a lot of racing these days, and uh, they're very, very successful together. This is how Stephen Mackler, his teammate, drew it up. Maintain the lead, build the lead, give me a cushion, and like nothing more for at least, probably the whole race for it to stay green. Chatting. Let's give uh, to uh, Mackley, excuse me, in the lead when he jumps in. In chatting with Eric about the transition from the Cayman that they raced last year in Pirelli GT4 America to this GT3 car, he said, quite honestly, the biggest cha change is how big the manual is. <laughs> it's like 70 pages long. He said just figuring out how to leave the pits yeah. was something else. Yeah, they're super sophisticated. When I was racing, I had a crank handle. Manny <laughs> <show. laughs> Franco crests the hill. Third place car in the pro category, running fifth overall. It is worth noting, it's different stateside than it is in some other championships where instead of a pro category, it's an overall category. So you can finish fifth overall and still be third in pro in the pro class. That's not always true in some other GT3 championships where you might get fifth place points for finishing in that spot. In fact, that's how it was for many years here, and that was changed relatively recently. Good little battle, battle developing here. A little compression here of this group. Second half of this pack is gradually inching into Samantha Tan, who's in the back of that little battle. So it'll be a six car battle here soon. This is great stuff at the front of it. See on Gondor. Right on back. Gondor running 10th overall. DeBoer 11th. Tan 12th. Smithson 13th. Bartone 14th. Luck 15th. All right there 
in one long train. Conga line making its way around Sonoma Raceway. Talked about the BMW factory driver being her partner this year, John Edwards, but Samantha also got named as a BMW brand ambassador this week, so that's a big feather in her cap. And, uh, certainly she and that whole team have been very loyal to the BMW brand over the last few seasons, had a lot of success uh, winning Sprint X championships here on the West Coast back in 18 and 19, I think it was. That said, they're going to be racing in Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe Endurance Cup this year in a Ferrari. They're going to start the season in a 488, and then when the new 296 becomes available, they'll make the switch. And that's going to take some getting used to, seeing that Vincent Van Gogh starry night livery on a prancing horse instead of on a BMW. I've never seen a Ferrari with a BMW rondelle on the front <laughs> of it. I know, I know. Here's Chandler Hall. We mentioned it off the top. He looks like a new man here. He's put in a ton of work on the physical fitness side. And Bill Oberlin was singing his praises earlier this weekend just about how far he's come. He's raced anything, anywhere in sports car racing, it seems like, each of the past couple of seasons. And that's helped to accelerate his learning curve. We drop behind him and find Adam Adelson making his GT3 debut in SRO competition at least. He's third overall, leader in Pro-Am, and George Kurtz hasn't been able to make any inroads, but he's also not falling away at all. He's not. He's looked really solid here today, so this is a great stint for him. Colin Brown, his uh, regular teammate, will be uh, jumping in. They're going to actually be competing at Le Mans together in an LMP2 car, so that's exciting for this whole group. Uh, this is one of those teams that has the continuity. We talk about all the new faces and new teams and new uh, cars in the championship this year. This is a team that they had wins last year, but they didn't finish as high in the championship as you normally expect. Just didn't have the consistency of results, but I think they found a great home by switching over to Riley Motorsports in uh, the offseason between 21 and 22. And, uh, George and Colin just seem very, very happy right now with the whole setup. It's been a good relationship between those two for many years now, even preceding them driving together. And they've emerged in recent years as a tandem that you must contend with if you want to win in the Pro-Am ranks just about anywhere. Born with George Kurtz. It's that downhill sweeper left hand. Turn the carousel. Long duration corner that puts a huge amount of strain on the outside tires. And it's about that time. Second driver starting to get suited and booted. That's Colin Brown with his Fermin Velez inspired helmet. Now, if you remember the great Spanish sports car driver made an Indy 500 start in Fermin Velez. Passed away recently. Several years ago. Yeah, yeah very sad. He was a wonderful man and a great driver. And Colin's dad, Jeff, worked uh, for Fermin and I think it was Andy Evans' team. I believe you're right. Time. And uh, I believe that Fermin was a great mentor for young Colin Brown, who was probably racing carts back then. Uh, I think it's a great gesture that Colin did by having his helmet colors in his, in his uh, the same as Fermin's. I think that's been the case for many years now. I think that preceded Fermin's passing, as a matter of fact. See that bump there as you come into turn one. That's why it gets so tricky. If you suddenly bite off a little bit tighter there, it can send you across the road and into that gray area we talked about where there is zero grip. Franco, solid job. Yeah. Top five overall, Seth Lucas given chase. Both pro cars, so this is a battle for third in pro that we're looking at, fifth and sixth overall. And a couple of laps ago, Seth Lucas was the fastest driver on the track. That was just two laps back. Turned in his personal best lap this deep into the stint. This is a track where you don't see that happen very much because tire wear such a big story, but perhaps it's getting free of traffic. Perhaps he's just getting into a rhythm. He's still very new to GT3 racing, is young Seth Lucas. We're about five minutes away from the pit window opening. It's 10 minutes long. Uh, you can't come in before that window opens, and you don't have to complete your service by the end of the 10 minutes, but at least be on pit lane. And typically, race one of the weekends when the AMs in the Pro-Am driver lineups are starting, the teams elect to try and get the AM out 
get your pro in, maximize their drive time as much as possible. And I think a real curiosity will be tomorrow with some uh, chinks in the, the rule book this year. When I say chinks, just some subtle changes in terms of if it's yellow during that full course, during that um, pit stop window, if it went full course yellow. I think we may see teams even elect to get their pros out early to protect against that happening whilst they're still out there on the track and then have to do the stop afterwards because pit lane will be closed for the pit stop at that point. And that will be something to keep an eye on as the season progresses, always combing the rule book yes. is our Calvin Fish. Well, I think the teams do as well. It's just really identifying and trying to forecast what may happen. All of the, It's all about you know, thinking about all of the what ifs, what may happen if this happens and the track position is this, what would that be consequential to? And um, they'll have thought that through. Uh, the rule has been out there for a while. Everyone's had a chance to chew on it. We'll see what teams elect to do tomorrow. Today is pretty much normal. They'll probably get the, the drivers in early within that window. Tomorrow, we may see some split decisions in terms of what they elect to do. Roll the dice a little bit, keep your pro in longer, maximize their time, you know, extend that performance that you're getting. Other people may like to play a bit more conservative and uh, hopefully they catch a break. And one other nuance to the rule book in this championship is the pro class, whereas in most series, if it's a pro class, you can run any driver you want. Here, you must run a silver rated or below driver to run in the pro class. And, and it's it's those silvers that are starting here. So in some in some cases, I think we might see even the pro cars following some of that, those same strategy patterns unless they feel really confident that their silver can carry up their end of the bargain. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a really good point. Another thing to think about is we used to always have a one-second joker that you could use once per weekend on that minimum stop time. And if you are a foul of that underneath, you're allowed up to one second. That has gone away now. So. They have to be a, more, be a bit more careful, and it's the first weekend, so getting all your software programmed so you don't want to foul of that is always a little bit tricky. That window will open 40 minutes into the race, so just under three minutes from now. And unlike, well, I, I, should, I should back up. So last year this was the case, but in previous years, the leader would get first dibs, so the pit lane would not open until the leader got a, a chance to come in. That went away a few years ago. So when that clock gets down under 50 minutes to go in the race, the pit lane is open for anyone to come in and get that service done if they so choose. Yeah, so if the leader is just past pit in and then the time is uh, open to come in, he's got to wait a whole lap and everyone else could pile in. Then if there's a yellow or anything happens, that's obviously the, the roll of the dice, the rub of the draw. But seeing a little bit of a change of positions here. Smithson has dropped to the back of this pack and Charlie Luck has made some nice moves to get that bright portion that you're seeing. That's one of the new 992 designated 911 GT3 Rs that we're looking at. Yeah, he'll share that with Jan Halen. So he had that quick spin, but he's uh, done a nice job of recovering and uh, pushing it forward. Yeah, Charlie, I suspect, is going to be hard on himself for that spin. This is his second year racing at this level. A couple of years ago, won the championship in GT America right. in a GT3 car for Wright Motorsports, the team he's racing for here. He had Jan Halen coaching him, and then the two jumped into the same cockpit, not at the same time, of course, but uh, last year, and very nearly, he made it two championships on the trot. It came right down to the wire. It did, and a uh, unique situation, uh, father-in-law and son-in-law. Mm -hmm. And uh, Charlie is also uh, married into uh, racing loyalty, the Petty family. That's my understanding, yes. tails away shot that turn 10 and when you don't run that turn 9 chicane that is an awesome corner is very challenging starting at a slower speed on the approach makes it pretty much wide open in these cars with the amount of downforce they have i think turn one and up through this first sector when i drove here i really found this super challenging just to position the car you got the bumps right through here that start about here kind of pushes the car out wide and then as you're cresting the hill uh, as we're looking at it on camera right now, it doesn't do it justice in terms of what you're seeing from behind the wheel because you can't see anything right there. Derek DeBoer, as he goes over that crest of the hill, he loses the racetrack for a couple of seconds, and then when he plunges down the other side, he's got a hope that the car is not too far left. Otherwise, you're in the dirt trying to break for turn four. Very cool to see Derek take this step. He's been a stalwart in GT4 for many years. Has a long history with TRG, but decided to go all in made the, the jump 
to Fanatec GT World Challenge America, powered by AWS, having Ross Gunn, as Calvin talked about earlier, as the, the factory driver pro in the lineup. That's a huge asset to this team. They've also got Mike Johnson working with them. Mike, known for many years for his work with the Archangel team, and his work with Magnus and other championships. He's been around the block, I guess it's safe to say. Not an old guy by any means, but a lot of experience. And the window is open, and here is our first taker, MDK Motorsports. And that's exactly what you're describing there. The leader's already passed the pit in, and uh, someone a little bit deeper in the pack has the first opportunity to come in. This is where you catch a break. If anything happens during this moment in the race, and I think you're going to see a domino effect here with everyone else piling in. The other advantage to pitting early here and this track in, protect, in particular is the high tire deck yes. at Sonoma. So if you continue, that's an extra lap at a slower pace than these cars are about to do with their pros in the car and on fresh tires. Fresh tires, and they've all got tire warmers now, so it's not like you're going out on cold tires. So uh, this is what we call the undercut. You're basically undercutting the field, trying to get those fresh tires on. Uh, we see it a lot in Formula One in terms of the advantage that you may have. So. To your point, you're going to suffer on the back end because uh, on the second stint you're deep rim, but then it's up to the pro to deal with that. It's all about track position, getting that track position, and then just managing the tires, even if you're struggling a bit towards the end. This is where the teams go to work. It's an 80 second, 87 second minimum pit in to pit out, including including uh, service, driver change, fuel, and Pirelli P zeros. We've seen. These pit stops determine these races. Very much so, particularly early in the season. Everyone's just trying to iron out the wrinkles. Here comes our leader now. Eric Filgaris uh, ticked all of the boxes here today. What an outstanding job by that young man. Here comes Chandler Hull, the rest of the pack. So this is basically the top five or six cars that did not have the opportunity to, to pit on the first uh, as the, the clock wound down. Here we're seeing Ashton Harrison staying out. I spoke to John Rugg, they said, will you be in early? He said, yes, so <laughs> they changed their mind pretty quick here. Well, maybe the thought is, let's try something different yeah. from everyone else. They shot themselves in the foot, quite frankly, with the way qualifying played out. So here comes, TR, uh, comes the uh, racers group car back on, on track. It's Ross Gunn driving that car. Interesting to see where Harrison slots in with these cars that have just come out of the pit lane. Yeah, well, her last lap was um, only about nine tenths off her best of the day, so she's not struggling, struggling too much with tire degradation, so that's probably why they elected to do that, figuring that a, a hot lap on cold, on worn tires will be better than an out lap on fresh tires just out of the ovens. It's close, but they've still got a long way to go to get to their peak operating and speed potential when they drive off pit lane. Garris out, now helping his teammate and friend Stephen McAleer strap in to that RS1 car. This is the leader as they ran coming into the pit sequence. Right Motorsports in the Delay here on the left front. Yep. Sometimes that pit stop window minimum delta helps you there if you have a little bobble. But he also had an 8.6 second lead when he came in, so you could afford a bit of a bobble when that's the difference. So he's leaving. Elliot Skier now takes off. That's Bill Oberlin. Uh, that was close there. I'm not sure if there was any overlap there. There's still a look at that one in terms of if Bill has to give that position up. If there's any overlap on the outside lane there, but it's tight when you're coming out of pit lane. You're boxed so close to pit exit. Now you've got cars with a lap on their tires. That'll be uh, Trent Nestor aboard the MDK machine there. should be in good shape here after this exchange, but he's going to be struggling a little bit compared to some of these uh, cars that pitted a lap earlier. And now Racer's Edge makes that call to come in. I think you're spot on. Ashton's pace, even on the worn tires, was still pretty good. Yes. They're trying to take advantage of that while they can. Now they've got a clear pit lane to work with. No worry about overlap here. And that Racer's Edge crew is as good as they come in this pit lane. Skier behind the wheel of the 120 now. We're having a few little timing and scoring issues here this weekend. Driver ID issues essentially is creating that. So um, we're getting those ironed out. So sometimes you'll see that acronym of the driver's name flashing on the windshield that will not be accurate. We've had these driver changes. So Super Mario and the team has been having a little bit of fun with uh, some fake. Uh, then they give up that track position. I think that was maybe a call by the stewards there as you see Skier around Bill Orblin. This is going to be really interesting, watching Elliot Skier. He's someone I did think 
several years ago was on the path to be in a position like this one. It took him a little while to get that great opportunity. He's found it now, and he gets a chance to measure himself against some of the very best GT drivers in the world, Colin Brown and Bill Oberlin, right on his heels. Yeah, the message just flashed up on timing and scoring. That was a call from the stewards for uh, correct, incorrect uh, pit lane protocol there. There's okay. any overlap. If you're on the side, even just by a foot, you have the outside lane has to go. It's tight there at pit exit. But I think uh, Bill definitely took a bit of an advantage there. The steward saw it and had him correct it immediately. That's, that's the best way. Make a decision yep. quickly. That's what drives the teams like to see. Stewards recognizing it, making the call, giving Bill Oberlin the, the time to give the position back. Here you'll see it'll just slow right there. And now he can go back on the attack. You don't want to hear it 20 minutes later when you've established a 10 second gap. Right, exactly. Again, that goes back to how they were released from the pit lane. If you are in the fast lane, the lane to the far right here at Sonoma, if there's any overlap at all between the car on the slow lane and the car in the fast lane, the car in the fast lane gets preference. You have to fall back in line. That's, that was not the case when they left the pits, but it was corrected very quickly, and now the race can resume with 44 minutes to go. Just to, just to alleviate any banging and barging into each other if it's really tight there when you're fighting, particularly towards uh, uh, the critical stage of a race. But Elliot Skier, he, he's not going to be easy. No. <laughs> Bill Orban to go and uh, catch and uh, get around. That Porsche from Wright Motorsports has been very, very rapid here this weekend. Yes, it has. This is the previous generation 991 variant of the 911, one of several in the field this weekend, but it shared the front row with the new 992-911, so there's still life in the old pony, that's for sure. Love this shot. It shows you the speed in these GT3 cars in one of the high speed, high commitment corners around this track. It really does. So they're looking at Elliott Skier aboard the 120, second overall, first in Pro-Am, Orbelin gives chase. But the leader right now is Stephen Mackler down the road by nearly nine seconds. So that is a nice margin for him to work with. Hear how patient you have to be on that downhill plunge through the carousel. You can't just chase that throttle even with the downforce. You've got to wait, let the car settle, and then gradually squeeze back on in full commitment by the exit. Let's look at this again here. This is what we were talking about. So Oberlin leaving in the BMW in the slow lane because he was next to or had overlap with Skier in the Porsche, he was supposed to yield that position. Quite frankly, to your point, Calvin, because of where that occurred at the end of the pit lane, and it's a really short exit to the pit lane there. I'm not sure there was a chance for Bill to easily fix that in the pits. That's where the stewards intervened, told Bill, move aside, let's steer through, and then resume the race. Your argument could be, you know, he's looking at pit out. Sure. Maybe not seeing him, but Bill's savvy enough. He would have known where he was, and he was just trying to uh, roll the dice there and take advantage of it. Why not? Uh, Effectively, no harm, no foul. Exactly. The way that You're going to go handled. for it, for sure, and just see if the stewards see it. Everyone has pitted at this stage. All 17 cars that are still on the track. Jeff Burton, unfortunately, has retired after his off-track excursion that brought out the lone full-course yellow of the race so far. At the very front, McAleer continues to hold a substantial lead of nearly eight seconds over Elliott Skier. This is Steven McAleer, but that is not for class position. So Skier right now runs second on the road but leads in Pro-Am, and he has Bill Oberlin separating himself from the next runner in Pro-Am, Colin Brown. Look at the fast laps, though. The last lap, I mean, uh, Macaulay was 8 tenths slower than the chasers behind him, mm. so uh, he can't afford to relax too much, otherwise those cars are going to catch him. There's a lot of time on the board. Steven's a savvy operator. Might he just be taking care of those Pirellis yeah, to make sure, sure he's got something, especially if there's a late race restart? That would be my bet managing it and also yeah they, they'd love the overall win but he'll also want to be you known where is the next pro car which is Bill Oberlin so he's yep. got a little bit of a buffer there as well in terms of that number 120 with uh, Elliott Skier behind the wheel. This is one of the things I was looking forward to most about this season. There's some new names in the championship and Elliott Skier among them is one that I thought let's see let's see how he stacks up when you put him against some of the very best at GT Racing, and so far he's absolutely holding his own. 
reeling in Stephen McAleer and keeping Bill Oberlin at bay. Hey, if you could do those two things, you're doing something right. I mean, Elliot burst on the scene, I'd say probably a decade ago now. I mean, he's still a relatively young man, but uh, 2015, eight years ago. And uh, Pat Long was a, a mentor of him. He yep. was under the Porsche guidance, and Pat Long being a Porsche factory driver at the time, uh, was very high on him, was trying to help him out. And then he just kind of disappeared off the scene a little bit, but just burst back through and um, just a, a very smart young man. And he and Adelson have got great chemistry. Yes. They just really have become great friends. Uh, they like the same things in a race car, uh, both very astute young guys, and uh, they're having fun and, and they're delivering as well. Share a passion for science fiction, I think it's safe to say. We learned that last year to have some interesting conversations off track that, frankly, I would not understand, uh, both on the sci-fi side of things and, and very mechanically and scientifically minded. Just a moment ago, we saw CrowdStrike fastest lap of the race to Colin Brown. He is flying at the moment, matching the lap times of Oberlin and uh, also Skier at this stage. And that group collectively is moving in on the RS1 Porsche of McAleer. But here we find Triton Estip, who came up that same Porsche ladder, the Porsche pyramid as they like to call it, a few years later, but that same pyramid that, that Elliot Skier climbed. Uh, and he's doing a nice job there for MDK, a little further back, Alessandro Balzan, who also had a few years away from the cockpit due to some medical issues. But this partnership with Manny Franco, very fruitful from the get-go, and he's in a great position here so far, running just off the podium in pro. Coming under some pressure, though, from a very racy Spencer Pompelli. Yeah, uh, Alessandro is just so savvy. I love his demeanor on the racetrack. Uh, he races super clean. Uh, but you could see it there. Yeah, Spencer had a big run, got his nose tucked to the inside. Spencer kept it clean, but now Balzan is very wide there. And it seems like that Porsche is hooked up a little bit more than yeah. uh, Balzan's car right now. So this might not take long for Spencer to make this move. As we said, we saw Spencer at lunchtime. He's very bullish about their prospects here this year with this car. You might say, OK, well, this isn't a battle for class position. Why would Balzan fight? Why would he? work so hard to keep an out-of-class car behind him. And I think the answer is Super Mario might have just picked up a mushroom, grown in size a little bit, and here he comes sprinting forward in the racer's edge. Acura right behind. That would be the next car in class for Alessandro to contend with. And it might be on his back bumper before he knows it because Pompelli carved through the carousel and blitzed around the outside. That pass was made long before turn 11. That was really nice. And I tell you what, that Porsche is really working well. He was able to take that car in super deep. He wanted to break a little bit later, not give Balzan the opportunity to try and break down to the inside. Still hit the apex, carved the corner. Still relatively early in the tire stint here, but nonetheless, that Porsche seems to be working very, very well. And that brings the battle to the back door of Alessandro Balzan. Here is Mario Farnbacher right now, fifth in the pro class. It's the back of the pro class, to be fair. And he's going to take a look immediately. Oh, not sure if that was a real attempt or just to make sure Alessandro knows he's there. Yeah, speaking of John Maraki, uh, before the race start here today, he said this is not a great racetrack for this Acura. Uh, we just struggle for grip here a little bit, and Mario slides it to the inside. He's going to force his way through here. So Alessandro's on the back foot a little bit. I think he's in survival mode. They recognize it. Oh, a little twitch there, Mario. Going super deep, going into that gray area, but keeps it together. But getting back to Balzan, that Ferrari that's chasing him, I think they're... They realize that they need more time with this car. Just don't throw it all away. You're going to struggle to defend that position all day long. Just uh, bring it home, score some solid points, and uh, dust yourself off. Ashton Harrison on the right, Lee Niffenegger from HPD on the left. Lee oversees on these GT racing efforts in North America on behalf of HPD, and he's got a smile on his face for good reason. He is a huge Mario Faunbacher believer and supporter, I mean, he... How could you not be, in fairness? Yeah, I mean, he's delivered every single time, and uh, you can put him up to with the best of the best. I mean, he's driven with a lot of really stout co-drivers in endurance competition over the years, and he's been up to the challenge every single time. So he has a lot of support from uh, HPD here. Great racing family, the Farnbachers. His father, Horst, his uncle, Herman, both of them racing drivers in their own right. They've got the brother family was, team. Uh, brother was yes. quick, too, Dominic. That's my next note now. You're reading ahead. Sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> Trouble.
trouble is if I let you read all your notes, I've got nothing left, so. <laughs> Point taken. Dominic, though, he was fun. He had yep. a very different demeanor. I mean, uh, Mario comes across as very serious. Uh, he'll have a laugh, and that team likes to have fun, but Dominic always had a big Danny Ricardo-type smile on his face whenever you saw him in the paddock. Yeah, Mario, the more Teutonic in disposition of the two. That's for sure. Back to the front of the Pro-Am fight. Here we find Adam Adelson, that big personality. Excuse me, that wouldn't be Adelson, would it? It would be Elliot Skier now driving that car. My apologies. But yeah, we, we started telling the Elliot Skier story a little bit, but 2015 was that breakout year for Elliot. He won single make Porsche championship for this Wright Motorsports team, by the way. So that is perhaps the connection, how they ended up working together here this weekend. That's a question I need to ask. But then, just a handful of starts the next year in GT4 and touring car level stuff, and I have nothing on his CV from 2017 to 2020. Turned up with Adam Adelson in 2021 and ran a partial GT4 America schedule, and they have not looked back since. So let's look at this again, because we've seen Alessandro Balzon slip back a couple of positions over the last few laps. This is Pompelli coming through first, and yep. Farnbacher was not too far behind. No, and uh, I think they're just struggling for grip. I spoke to Chachi, their engineer, and he just said, yeah, we need more time. There was also a right high adjustment made on the Ferrari. Um, to give a better performance uh, during the course of this race week, but that changes everything when you're making a monumental change like that. Uh, there's a lot of other things that go with that in terms of now finding a new setup. It's a change in overall position. Spencer Pompelli for ACI Motorsport has gotten around Trenton Estep. And that's neat to see that uh, battle between the two different generations of the Porsche 911 GT3R. Spencer, I bumped into him at a racetrack last weekend and he was talking about having the older generation car and I said, well, what do you think about it? He said, you know what? He might not be a bad spot to be in and he is proving to be exactly right. He is third place in the Pro-Am class as they run. Back to the overall lead here. This is uh, Stephen McAleer and his co-driver, Eric Filgaris. When he wrapped up his first stint in a GT3 car, he had an eight and a half second lead, Amanda. I'm sure he's thrilled. Oh, he absolutely did. It's funny, we were just absolutely talking about that and that stint, and he wanted to make sure he had that with the tire deck that is here at Sonoma. But Eric, your first debut here in Fanatec GT, when you recap it in your mind, uh, what will you just think of this performance for yourself? Yeah, I think we had a goal, um, and that was for me to, to get a gap. Uh, clean air is really important here, not only because of the tire deck, but, but the way that these cars generate their grip. If a car is, cl is closing in or following closely to another car, uh, they lose all of their, their aerodynamic grip and high-speed grip. So um, it's really tough to pass here. Clean air is very important. It's been uh, a heck of a week. Uh, I mentioned before in the uh, qualifying session two, three days ago, I don't think we would have imagined ourselves here. Uh, we jumped in the deep end and haven't had a lot of time in this car, and not only the team, myself, Steven, um, but it's, it's been incredible. I got to send a special shout out to Concourse Club in Miami, Florida. Um, they allowed us to come here or come to their, their facility and test. It's a fantastic facility. Uh, thanks so much to RS1 Community Beer Works for putting this program together. And we've got uh, a little bit of time left. Steven's doing a fantastic job. We'll see where we're at when the clock strikes zero. And Tom Kopchinski, who is the owner of Community Beer Works, he is a big believer in that young man, Eric Fogaris. And actually, Eric coaches him in some other Porsche single bank series. He had a podium, didn't he, last weekend he somewhere? So uh, they're pretty pumped about that. But you talk about the eight and a half second gap, it's now down to 6.4 seconds. So definitely. Elliot Skier and uh, Auckland's in tow as well are catching this leader, but as you said, uh, Stephen Mackle is probably managing that gap a little bit, making sure he's got some tires underneath him should he get a late race caution and have to uh, defend. Final podium spot in pro. That's the battle we're looking at between Trenton Estep and Mario Farnbacher. MDK Motorsports and Racer's Edge. Racer's Edge, if you're used to following this championship, it's not a new name by any stretch of the imagination. MDK might be a new name to you. Mark Kwame is the man behind that. He's been a racer in his own right for quite some time. The 
team started actually in Supercross or Motocross racing, but just uh, over a year ago expanded into sports car racing, ran Porsche Cup cars for a time, and they've been really busy since then, running some in the Middle East. They ran at Daytona in the 24 hours earlier. They've lured Jan Magnussen into their driver lineup a few times. Jan and his son Kevin actually drove together uh, back over the off season in a, a team car from MDK. They've got big, big plans and they operate out of a great shop in Columbus, Ohio that used to be the home of the Meyer Shank Racing IndyCar and prototype team. Yeah, I think Kevin's actually a brand ambassador for the group as well uh, during his Formula One exploits running with the Haas Formula One team, of course. They're running down in Aussie. It'll be a late night for me tonight. Trying to watch that before I uh, hit the sack for tomorrow's activities. But a cool lineup Ooh, for them. Oh, that was man. a twitch. Yes, it was. When you see it from the outside, it is arms and elbows inside that cockpit, let me tell you. And that car has done that a couple of times in that quarter. Maybe not quite as noticeably as that. Let's look at it again. It's right here. The car is loaded. Then as you get down the hill, you start to lose a bit of grip. And I think Mario's just asking the car for a little bit more. He's trying to chase down that Porsche. And it just gives up on him where the road goes away from you and the road is not helping any longer and you're still trying to carry the speed. Cost him in his pursuit of the youngster, Triton Estep. Now we find this battle, Ross Gunn up against Jan Halen. And when you look at the pros in this field, whether it's in the pro class or the pros in the pro-am lineups, it is some of the heavy hitters in global GT racing. Just phenomenal to see these two squaring off as part of the Pro-Am fight. And it looks like, perhaps did Haywin make the pass on that last lap? I think he was scored ahead on the previous lap Correct. and indeed did get by Ross Gunn at some point on that last lap. So that's a change of fifth position in Pro-Am. Yeah, Ross Gunn on debut here at this racetrack. Yep. Uh, we're supposed to get him for one of the test days, but he had a flight delay coming out of the UK where he's uh, testing his British GT car. Uh, but really nice young man, super successful. Been an Aston Martin factory driver since 2016, 26 years old, lives near Oxford in the UK, running three programs this year, so he's a busy boy, uh, but he's one of the best. Uh, really admired by the whole Aston Martin racing uh, team. That's why they keep him so busy. 2015 British GT, GT4 champion, Ross Gunn and his teammate, Jamie Chadwick. Oh, wow. Multi-time W Series oh, champion, current Indy Next driver. I believe his mum and dad raced as well, and I think his career was a bit on a, a bit of a lull, and he got sponsored by an ice cream company. Beach Dean. You got exactly. It. And his father, I believe, also raced with some Beach Dean sponsorship uh, at one point or another. At least that's what my notes say. But he also used race cars against the likes of Lando Norris, Albon, and current uh, Grand Prix drivers, uh, George Russell, so he's Ross, top of the tree. Yeah. yeah, no question. So after dispatching of Ross Gunn, Jan Halen now has his sights on Adam Carroll. Adam hasn't quite had the same pace as some of the other pros this weekend, but this is a team drinking out of the fire hose. We'll see how hard he's going to fight with Jan here for fourth in the Pro-Am class. He's going to fight pretty hard, it looks like. Elbows are out. Don't know if there was any contact, but if there wasn't, doesn't get much closer than that. Now he left the door wide open, and you don't do that with Jan Halen without him taking that invitation, but he had enough uh, grip on the outside to make the uh, Mercedes stick. Now he opens oh. up the door again a little bit. This is going to help uh, Ross Gunn, who's uh, in close proximity here to close in on this little battle. So uh, if Adam Carroll gets too feisty here, if there's any argy-bargy, you might see Ross Gunn take advantage. I asked... Adam about this team, as is racing with Mercedes of Austin is the team. Uh, just how new is this team? He looked at me and blinked a couple times and said, it's new. <laughs> so everyone is learning. They've got some very experienced people on staff headed by Dave O'Neill, who engineered Adam to the A1 GP championship for Team Ireland a decade plus ago. But uh, that said, they still have some learning to do and they know it. That said, running in the top five right now in Pro-Am. Down to Amanda. 
Ryan, and just adding on that conversation, when I talked to Will Hardeman earlier here this weekend, it is going to be a partial season for this team. They're running here this weekend. They're running at NOLA. They'll be at Coda and at Road America. Said it's a partial season. Uh, wants to go to events that he can bring his family along. Uh, raced uh, carts back in the day. Absolutely loving being in this a AMG uh, in the Mercedes, said it's his first time in this platform and just loves how the car has come to him. They did test at NOLA, but a partial season to start with the family on board with hopes to build up uh, towards a full season in future seasons. Yeah, they're talking like this could be a team that expands in pretty rapid fashion with some big plans for next year. But of course, a lot of that is dependent on things going well this year, and the early returns are good. Carroll might not have the pace, but he's got the racecraft at least so far to keep Jan Hanwin behind. Jan's throwing everything he's got at him. Yeah, he's got to figure this one out because it's compromising his lap time and uh, certainly affecting his ability to look further down the road. So the next Pro-Am car is way up there in fifth place overall. That's the number 16 machine. So uh, he's got to do some work here quickly because time will run out on him. 24 minutes and change to go. A race that has been dominated from the outset by RS1. Eric Filgaris started it. Stephen McAleer is continuing it, but behind that Porsche, the battles have been fierce throughout this field. Right here, we're looking at fourth and fifth, and sixth for that matter, in the Pro-Am class. Yeah, I think Dan is gonna get frustrated here pretty quickly. Uh, I think he's getting stymied here. He hasn't really found the rhythm of what Adam's doing with that Mercedes to uh, try and figure out a solution to this puzzle, but Jan is one of those drivers who's not afraid to get his elbows out. He is incisive. If there is a gap, he goes for it. No questions asked. And I'm not sure these two have raced together much, talking about Carroll and uh, and Jan Halen. Jump up here to another good fight that's broken out. Colin Brown and Bill Oberlin. This is happening just a second or so behind the Pro-Am leader, which is Elliot Skier. He's done a phenomenal job matching the pace of two of the top pros anywhere in the world. He has, and certainly for Colin Brown, he is gonna get pretty feisty here on Bill Oberlin if he's got the ability and got some uh, speed underneath him because he can see that the uh, Pro-Am leader is only a second and a bit in front of that BMW. So if he can get around Bill Oberlin, which is not gonna be easy, despite his age, 54 years old, he's celebrating his 55th birthday this October, but still, is able to squeeze the speed out of these BMWs. So long association, over 500 races now with BMW. Just remarkable record. Unbelievable. Bill Oberlin, the career that he's put together. We think of him and BMW as being intrinsically linked, but there was a time before BMW, and you just have to go a long way back. Oh, that was the move up the hill. And Haywin finally did find a way past Adam Carroll. Now it's Ross Gunn's turn to try and repeat the feats. Yeah, I thought he was going to get a bit more aggressive there. He sort of like uh, practiced that move a couple of times. He must have been a little bit closer and shoved that in a little bit deeper that go around. Bill slipped wide at 11. Tough saw place that to through, take advantage of. Saw it. that through turn six on this uh, previous lap to this one as well. So I'm not sure if he's uh, lost the handle on his race car a little bit. He's got a factor in risk versus reward as well. I mean, uh, he's probably, I mean, Bill likes to win, so he's thinking about McAleer down the road leading overall and leading pro, but he's six and a half seconds to the good on Bill Orblin, so good second place points here. Don't throw it away by trying to fight Colin Brown too hard. And who knows, if he lets Colin through, maybe he and uh, Skier can get together and open up the door again for Bill Orblin. We should note that this trio is slowly but yep. surely making progress on Stephen McAleer. It was once an eight and a half second lead. It's down to 5.2. But at this rate, I'm not sure there's enough time left to make a real impact unless McAleer's pace really drops off. It's right on the cusp when you look at the time on the board and uh, the gap that he's, he's closing in. Um, I would say if, unless McAleer can start to find a little bit of pace. All of these guys are going to be right with McAleer by the end of this race, the way the math works out. Got a glimpse of a very nervous looking George Kurtz a moment ago. His driving is done. Stepped out of that crowd strike Mercedes, third in the frame. Super solid day for George. Really, really good drive here today. And that sets up your teammate to uh, go on the attack here in the second half of this race. 
as you'd expect from George Kurtz at this stage in his GT3 racing career. Keep in mind, already a class winner at what is now the CrowdStrike 24 Hours of Spa. Uh, picked up that win for the SPS team last year in the AM class. And CrowdStrike's involvement in racing generally, but SRO in particular, continues to grow as the new title sponsor of the Blue Ribbon event. 24 Hours of Spa is coming up this summer as part of the Intercontinental GT Challenge, powered by Pirelli, as well as Fanatec GT Challenge, World Challenge Europe, powered by AWS Endurance Cup. Collins' car looks really good. It did in the hands of George's. Looks super stable here. The setup that Bill Riley and the whole group there at Riley have uh, given this crowd strike entry today is uh, on the money. Orblin is feisty. Just hates to give anything away on the racetrack. And he's just thinking, I need to stay in this game. Anything can happen. He's got so much experience. He's been around the block so many times. He knows he's just got to keep fighting hard, keep as close to McLeod, who leads overall and in class as he can, and just seeing if there's a sniff of a win. Comparing yeah. lap times between these three at McAleer. It's pretty even that time, really no headway. Certainly from Elliott's gear, just about even equal with this car and the Scotsman, Stephen McAleer. This looks like a probably GT4 America <laughs> race from 2022. Here comes Colin Broke Brown out. down to the inside. Can't quite get it tugged. He might get better by coming off the corner. This is going to be a drag race here. BMW against Mercedes, right along the drag strip here at Sonoma Raceway. That's just to the right of that concrete wall, the right-hand side of the shot. Oh, but the track came back to Bill, and he used it to his advantage, even though it looked like Colin might have had something for him that time. Look at the commitment here. With the elevation change, you can't see them when you got that big BMW in front of you. Very, very tricky to hit your marks for Colin Brown or any following driver, for that matter, coming through this sector of the racetrack. Now the plunge back down the hill from the highest point of the track. In total, 15 stories of elevation change from highest point to lowest. This is perhaps the most precipitous drop anywhere on the track. This flowing left-handed 180 degree turn at number six, also known as the carousel. Well, Brown with a run, looking at the inside. Oh, this is Edwards in pit lane, problems for the uh, STR machine. It's the car that Samantha Tan started. BMW factory driver John Edwards, new to the team-ish. Saw him at Indianapolis last year. But excited about this new challenge and a new championship. Yeah, you remember Turner there at uh, Indy last year. Uh, obviously BMW factory driver, only allowed to drive BMWs globally. Uh, for him, he, he's, he's stoked about this opportunity with STR, but it does mean there's a clash for him with the Nürburgring 24, so he'll not be competing there this year that he's done in previous uh, episodes of that race. This battle isn't going anywhere. See how they compare on this lap. He has pretty much plateaued all of the top four running similar lap times, so early in the run, it looked like McAleer was losing about six, seven tenths a lap to these chasers. Then it dropped to about three to four, and now it's pretty much even. And we should note, within a few timing and scoring snafus, it is the first race weekend for all of us here this year. Uh, so a few of the names on the timing and scoring pylon on the left-hand side of the screen might be mixed up. So, for instance, we see Adelson listed in the second place overall car. That is Elliott Skier driving that one. We'll do our best to correct that as we go through the final 16 minutes or so. But no question about who's in these two cars. Bill Oberlin, Colin Brown, currently third and fourth overall and fighting for a position second and third within their own class. Yeah, just running down that list, it is McAleer aboard the 28. We've got Elliott Skier on board the next car, then it is Auburn, it is Brown, it is Spencer Pompelli in the 16. Oh, there's a big moment riding on board there with Colin. Seems like they're getting to that part of the stint, Ryan, where these tires are starting to 
give up a little bit. We talk about the sliding, low grip nature of this race surface. Well, Cal, look, let's let's compare lap times. Last lap for McAleer, a 141.3. His personal best is a 138.3. So we're talking degradation to the tune of three seconds from the start of the stint to the present. And, and still, still 15, 15 minutes, minutes to go, yeah. <laughs> looked at the clock at the same time. That's a lot of time. You know, that's basically 10 laps and uh, the tires are not at their best. And suddenly orblin has got a little bit closer here to Elliott Skier. He's got a ton more experience than Elliott Skier aboard one of these GT3 machines. Will that come into play here? Mackler's lead up front is 5.8 over these chasers. We saw the moment from onboard. Ooh, what does it look like? Big. Yeah, you, you can see, see the opposite lock. You can see the angle of the front wheels Ooh. there. Big, big catch. That's did. just when you start to ask for that little bit more. We saw it from Mario Farnbacher in this particular corner about five, ten minutes ago. Then you saw it evident there by Colin Brand. Just, you're pushing, you just want to squeeze and chase a little bit harder and the tire and the car just gives up on you. Ross Gunn now on the attack here on Adam Carroll. Yeah, Halen has absolutely disappeared. Sellers on the rebound, down to the inside. That was tight. Three cars all from the Pro-Am class running together. Carroll leading Gunn, leading Sellers, and not too far behind is Daniel Morad. Battle for fifth, this is what we're looking at in Pro-Am. Morad has got the fastest lap of the day. That nine car has really come alive here. TR3 racing. Shares that car was the Ad Gandor. So as we anticipated, Daniel Morad can really make one of these Mercedes platforms work. He has a huge following on social media. His Moradness Twitch channel, very, very popular in the sim racing community. Just a huge personality, Daniel Morad. But hasn't had too many chances to really race in the real world. Lots of esports, and he does that on behalf of Mercedes. But he said, I only did four races in a GT3 car all of last year. One of them was Indianapolis. He was quick to say, that helped to put me on the map. And then his stand-in drive filling in for Lucas Auer with the Windward team at Daytona also opened a lot of eyes. And I asked him, hey, how much did that have to do with you getting this opportunity? He said that was everything. Yeah. When, they, when the team approached Mercedes and said, what do you think about Daniel? Mercedes said, absolutely. Yeah, no, he's, he's an ace. He, he's one of those drivers who's nearly slipped through the net a couple of times, had a really bright single-seater yep. career, uh, had a big following up in Canada. Ian Willis, who ran AIM Autosport for a number of years, was very high on him. And uh, then he had some momentum. And Whoa! Then, oh, was that a touch or not? Or did Estep just uh, lose step a little bit there, no pun intended? If it wasn't, again, there couldn't have been more than a paper's width between the two cars. That's a big move, though, for Mario Farnbacher, completing, in some respects, the recovery that they've needed to go on after poor results in qualifying. Let's look at this here. How close was it? It's hard to say still. Could have been. You don't need much at that point. That's nope. right at that critical phase of the corner. That gets them critically up one more position. Podium. Yes, in the pro class, coming from 14th overall and now running sixth overall. What a great day, making up for a difficult qualifying session for both Ashton Harrison, who was phenomenal in her stint, gained six spots, and then Mario Farnbacher, who's on his way to sealing the deal. Tell you what, Elliot Skier in front of Orbelin and uh, Colin Brown has done an excellent job. Just really so impressive. We talk about some of these young drivers. Here's another look at this moment with Super Mario behind the wheel. Is there a touch? Is there? Or do you just get close enough to disturb the air a little bit? Well, whatever it was, everyone was able to continue on, and Farnbacher is up onto the podium as they run with just under 11 minutes to go. McAleer lost a half a second of his lead on that one lap alone. It's now down to 4.6 at the front. Still some time on the board here, probably another seven laps or something like that. But, crucially, the car chasing is not for class position. Correct. So, how much of an incentive to truly fight is there for Elliott's gear? I would say, from where I'm sitting, 
Not much at all. No. And that has to be great news if you're Stephen McAleer and you're RS1. It is. There's a move to the outside. That was on the exit of the chicane. Colin Brown got the power down. Bill Oberlin did not. And that position has now changed. Now, I misspoke earlier. That is not for class position. But that does then turn Colin Brown loose to try and get to the back of Elliott Skier, and it looks like it all started here, Calvin. A mistake, a rare one, from Bill Oberlin. Yeah, not sure if he got into the ABS a little bit there. What that will do is take away some of your braking so you don't lock up one of those front tires. You just wash out wide, and Colin was there and passed immediately. Now it's game on in terms of that pro-am battle for victory. He's gonna try and escape the attention here of Oberlin and set sail here, see if he's got, we saw him twitching and sliding a little bit when he's trying to make some moves on Oberlin. Does he have enough car underneath him, enough time on the board to chase down Elliott Skier aboard the 120 Wright Motorsports Porsche. And the equation is now changed for Skier. Now he does have an incentive to take the fight to the overall leader because if he can get by, that gives him a buffer to the chasing car, Colin Brown. Not sure he's gonna get there, not sure it's going to matter, but the calculus for Elliott has changed. No change here though. Ross Gunn and Adam Carroll, if they didn't know each other before, well, they do now. Keep it clean. Who knows? They could be sharing the same plane going home to <laughs> the UK after this one. But look at Daniel Morad yeah. looking really racy here. This is fantastic stuff. There's battles brewing here in the last 10 minutes of this race. So we cut away from Bill Orblin. It looked like Spencer Pampali was right there as well. So what does he have in the fight? He's in a podium position right now. But is there more available to the number 16 ACI motorsport car? We'll get back to that. But this battle is raging right now. Morad, from fastest Morad. lap. Put in perspective, he's run a lap time at 137.0. Our fastest lap from the leader is at 138.3. Boy, he is flying. There is Spencer. Yep. He has been absolutely flying here this afternoon. So Papelli from the Pro-Am class, Oberlin in the Pro class. So this did not, does not affect class position, does not affect points for either of these two cars, but Certainly two of the hardest chargers in the second half of this race have been Popelli in this Porsche and Morad in that TR3 Mercedes. Both of them have been rapid. Yeah, and I think from Auburn's perspective, I would almost, oh, look at this, Morad to the outside of Ross Gunn. Oh, little touch. Door to door between the Aston and the Mercedes. Those two share some similarities, those cars. stuff really really cool this has allowed uh, Carroll to escape here a little bit yes. I'm not sure if the uh, gun has just been uh, having to slow things down to defend great news for Adam Carroll who was putting up a pretty stout defense and Ross Gunn looked like he might have been at the end of his tether but now he finds himself bending off a challenge from Daniel Morad any tire saving now nope. <laughs> it's, uh, ring its neck Try and get around him, whatever you have to do. Papelli and Oberlin, how many times have these two raced door to door over their respective illustrious careers? Yeah. If I'm Bill Oberlin, I wouldn't be fighting this too much. Just bring it home. Nice solid points, run a P2 in the pro class right now. No point in risking getting a little bump. Even if there's contact and the other driver's at fault, you're back, would you lose track position? Not worth the risk, I don't feel. Not much to gain by fighting Spencer here. Would you agree, two of the more prolific American sports car racers of the last 20 years? For sure, I mean, obviously Bill's got more accolades, but Spencer's won some very big races. He probably hasn't had the same opportunity that Bell has, Bill has had uh, consistently to run in competitive machinery, but um, Spencer's a lot younger than, than Bill still, so he's got many good years ahead of him, and I don't think Bill intends to be giving, the, giving it up anytime soon either. Spencer loving this chance to get back into GT3 competition in this series. Okay, this is interesting. This is Gunn and Morad. Crossing to the left is Morad. Gets alongside Ross, side by side. Watch this. Oh, up over the curb. He's gonna stick it in there, yeah. That was nicely done. And credit to Ross for giving him room. Then he crosses back over, just the track goes away from him, but boy. That was top stuff from two excellent GT drivers. Yeah, beautiful racecraft there by Daniel Morad. I, th I think Ross Gunn is just struggling a bit with the balance of that race car in comparison. So tough to fight that, but um, 
he gave it everything, but Daniels threw and on his way. Just over five minutes left in the season opener for Fanatec GT World Challenge America, powered by AWS. You know what? We haven't even mentioned the fact. No K-Pax racing in the series this year. Two-time and defending series champions. They've moved on. They're going to vie for honors in Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe, powered by AWS Endurance Cup this year. But with them gone, and with Turner as well not turning up, they had a program fall through kind of last minute that would have kept them on the grid here. But that left this a wide open championship coming in. We talked about it a lot at the top of the show, and that's exactly how it's played out. Some new faces popping up, some veterans who you expect to be strong doing exactly that. It's fun going into a year with absolutely no idea who is. is the lineup to beat. Yeah, it is. And then we had the curveball in uh, qualifying number one this morning with a, a red flag and yeah. limited track time and who was going to respond and uh, execute. Some great storylines from day one of the championship season. Looking at the cars that have made the biggest moves. Oh, and this is one of them. It's from Pompelli, dirt tracking it through the exit of the carousel. That car is up eight spots. Same could be said for Farnbacher and Harrison. Crossing over Bill Oberlin to the inside, and Spencer Pompelli grabs the spot away. Yeah, I think Spencer knew that he had the advantage, and I think for Bill, you'd have to think he's in communication with the team. And if I was on that pit box for Oberlin, I'd be saying, don't fight it too hard, Bill. Just bring home the points. Solid, solid day backing up what they did here last year with a win and eight podiums and finishing third in the Pro-Am Championship. It all started right here, Calvin. Yeah, you're just trying to pinch it and there you can see the rear end gives up a little bit because you've got too much steering input compared to normal, but you're still able to get in position, do the crossover into the brake zone and put him away. Look how quickly Morad is caught. Yeah, and how far off Ross Gunn has fallen. I wonder if there's something amiss with the TRG Aston Martin because he was absolutely on the pace of these two not so long ago. He was, I just think they lost the balance in the race car, so uh, he's uh, just trying to bring it home at this stage. He's got nothing left to fight with. When these tires fall off a cliff, and I don't mean literally, but when the performance just uh, does that, I mean, I don't care who you got behind the wheel, and Gunn is one of the best in an Aston Martin. Uh, you can't fight too hard. And it's all part of the game, is you know, there's no, oh, look at that late move by Morad. That's going to be tight. Little touch, little argy bargy off of turn 11. Nice, nice racing. Morad is absolutely flying here this afternoon. This is fun to see. That TR3 group led by Gregory Ormanelli. They're showcasing that they can get the most out of one of these Mercedes, just like they did with Ferraris and Lamborghinis in years past. Two drivers with deep open wheel roots that have found a home in GT racing. Adam Carroll and Daniel Morad. This is the battle for fifth in Pro-Am. Like Carroll's getting more comfortable while the car's balance is coming back to him. He looked like he was more vulnerable early in the stint and now he looks a bit more stable and got some performance there. To the front of the field we go because I'm expecting the white flag this time by for RS1. Shades of 2022 in Pirelli GT4 America where they dominated the silver class. Because one more. Uh, you're right. Yeah, the timing of that is going to work out. Should be two more laps here to the checkered flag unless he can manage it and slow it way down. But uh, this is going to give everyone a step. He's got a lead of 2.2 seconds right now. So. It's going to be tight, but I think he's got enough in hand as uh, Skia continues to give chase. Still has that Pro-Am class lead. Colin Brown is right there, so Skia's going to not let off here. He's going to keep pushing hard. So this is interesting, the way this is shaping up. As they run, it's a debut team and lineup from RS1 leading in the Pro class. Not a debut team, but a debut lineup from Wright Motorsports leading in Pro-Am and by default, admittedly, but a debut lineup leading the AM class as well with the Bartone brothers, Andy Pilgrim and uh, Anthony Bartone. So it could be six completely fresh faces on the top step of the podium in their respective classes. Um, that's great, that's what we anticipated, looking at the entry list coming into this weekend. So much potential, who would gel quickly, how would the new cars perform? 
getting some answers pretty rapidly here today. Colin Brown is starting to close in on Elliott Skier, but it took him just that little bit too long, I think, to clear Bill Oberlin to turn it into a true race unless Elliott has a bobble. The same can be said for Elliott in his pursuit of Stephen McAleer, who comes around turn number 11 and should see the white flag this time by. Starter has it in hand. It's and for the RS1 the clock. team. It was just a second. If he was a second, uh, if he backed off a second, he could have got the victory a lap earlier. He's got to just keep digging here. Oh, was so close there when he crossed the stripe. <laughs> so he's going to have to earn it. Another trip around Sonoma Raceway, two and a half miles, 12 turns. And victory lane would await on the other end for RS1, Stephen McAleer and Eric Filgaris. The first GT3 race for Filgaris and the team, and the first in a Porsche for McAleer. I'd say it gives Colin Brown another opportunity, but Elliot Skier is just not blinking. Just tremendously consistent performance here. Working the car there, you can see a little bit of understeer, a little bit of oversteer, he's doing everything right now. He's not doing anything well, he's just <laughs> hanging on to it. Skier was six tenths of a second quicker than McAleer on the last lap, but it's still a 1.7 second gap. Give Eric Filgaris the credit because he built an eight and a half second lead for McAleer to manage, and that's what it's taken basically for McAleer to still hold the lead this late in the going. They needed a green flag race, and, and they pretty much got it after that early caution. And that exactly worked out with their strategy, and uh, they're smart enough and savvy as enough to know exactly what they needed. McAleer said it to Amanda in his interview, we just need a green flag run here and we've got a chance. Out of turn 10 and into turn 11 for the final time. The RS1 team taking this step up with the rating Pirelli GT4 America Silver Class Champions and they start their Fanatec GT careers off in fine form. RS1, Eric Filgaris and Steven McAleer win overall in race one at Sonoma and Wright Motorsports. Adam Adelson and Elliot Skier are victorious in Pro-Am. Oh, and Brown comes home in second in Pro-Am, third overall. Spencer Pompelli, Pedro Torres at ACI, they end up on the Pro-Am podium. Then Oberlin and Farnbacher completing the Pro podium. How about that recovery from Racer's Edge after starting 14th, able to race their way up to sixth and onto the Pro-Class podium. And here, the Bartone brothers racing, real-time racing, Mercedes AMG GT3 with longtime sports car racer Andy Pilgrim completing what Anthony Bartone started. They're running unopposed this weekend, but they've had the kind of day they dreamed of. A clean run in this race, at least, from start just about to the finish here. Yeah, nice solid run, nice rebound after a little uh, qualifying mishap this morning. But it's all about learning. I mean, that's what Anthony Bartone is here for. He's got tremendous pace. He's really impressing people. And um, he'll put that one in the back of his head and recognize, you know, cold tires early in a session. Just got to bide my time a little bit longer before I push. Exciting to see drag racing royalty here in the sports car racing paddock. It's exactly what Anthony Bartone is. And he's teamed up with sports car racing royalty. Andy Pilgrim, Anthony Bartone, and real time win in the AM class here at Sonoma Raceway. But the team of the hour, RS1, and I would love if we could inject a little truth serum into this driver pairing. If I would love to know if they thought this was really possible here this weekend to win on debut. First ever GT3 race for Eric Vilgaris. Pull and win. Yeah, I don't think they, I mean, I think they would have been thinking top five podium would be sweet, but I don't think they'd even dream of winning first time out. They don't have enough time with the car and you run up against such experience, but Phil Gira set the table with that pole run this morning in that abbreviated session, then did the deal, ticked all of the boxes and uh, you hand over the reins to someone like Stephen McAleer. He doesn't make mistakes. He managed that race perfectly. I don't think he had the fastest race car by a long way. I mean, he's 1.3 seconds off, fastest lap of the day, but had enough in hand to just bring it home. But it was getting tight there at the end. It's getting squeaky. And it's a race win, the first in SRO competition for the 992 variant of the Porsche 911 
GT3R, a pair of the 991 generation Porsches are on the Pro-Am podium, including the class winner, but also the ACI Motorsport team with Spencer Pompelli and Pedro Torres. Great debut for them as they make the big jump up to Fanatec GT. They're in the mix too. The old standbys, Bimmer World and Riley, the teams you expect to be there. This is shaping up to be one whale of a season if this is any indication. Oh, it's going to be fun. It really is. And uh, tomorrow you got the pro starting, so there'll be some fireworks at the beginning of this. Let's not forget, this car that just won is going to be starting from P12 yeah. tomorrow. So let's see what McAleer can do when he's on the back foot a little bit. Hey, and we know it's possible to race your way forward. We saw Ashton Harrison do exactly that in her stint to get onto the pro class podium. Sixth overall, made huge gains. In her time behind the wheel, Mario Farnbacher completed the deal. A couple of really nice passes that we caught late in the going to gain those crucial spots. And that kind of recovery for them, the reigning Pro-Am champions now in the Pro class, it could be so crucial when we get to the end of the season as they chase Pro class championship honors. Helmet comes off from Stephen McAleer, and Amanda is there to talk to him. And the number one Pirelli hat's going to go on Stephen Macklear. And Stephen, the guys in the booth were discussing if there's any way possible you guys thought you could kick off a debut weekend with the not only the pole, but back it up with the checkered flag. Was that ever a thought for this team? It has to be, you know, based on the year we had last year. Uh, you know, what, a, what, a, what an amazing car this Porsche GT3 are. Um, I tried my hardest at the start there to conserve some tire because of how well Eric had done in the first stint. Um, and I saw, you know, two or three cars coming at the end there. Hey, man. We won a GT3 race. I saw, uh, you know, a couple of cars catching me at the end there. I think they were still going to get to me, but I had saved enough tire that when they got to me, I was fairly comfortable I could hold them up. But uh, it gets greasy out there. That was, uh, was a lot of fun hanging on. Just want to say uh, hello to Tom K back at home and uh, thanks to Rent Sport One. And uh, obviously an incredible job here by Eric Fogettis. Eric, the guys were talking about just your pursuit of becoming a racing driver and how hard it's been and how you've been in the pits, knocking on doors, trying to get this opportunity. I know your dad and family's watching from home. Can you even believe this moment that you're having for yourself? Yeah, it's incredible. Our first uh, GT3 race ever as a team, driver pairing, and our first win. So there's a lot of people that have put this together. Um, first of all, thanks again to Tom Kopchinski. Unfortunately, he's not here. Uh, he had shoulder surgery recently, so he's missing out on this, and uh, he's he's the backbone of this. RS1 has done an incredible job. Um, thanks again to Concourse Club, who gave us the opportunity to come test the car. Steven's been fantastic. Uh, Porsche Motorsport, Porsche Naples, everybody who helps us put this program together, and we have one more race tomorrow. And the dream is real. Congratulations, you guys. Moving on to the Pro-Am winners. The hugs, the celebrations between you guys. Adam, I talked to Elliot uh, as you were driving, and he just said how impressed he was with you at every step of the way that you you surprise him at everything you do. You told Ryan and I that you were born to race a GT3 car, and now you have the win here. Yeah, it really feels that way. I mean, this guy right here taught me everything I know about how to drive a car, and uh, that's ultimately what got us here today. It's teamwork. Wright Motorsports put up an incredible team effort, world class. They're a team that can go compete with anyone, anywhere, and dominate. And uh, I just can't tell you how happy I am right now. Elliot, it's see incredible. it. Seeing that checkered flag, how much confidence will this give this team? Oh, it's everything with it, right? Our first time out with it. Um, we did Dubai earlier this year, and that was a very good showing. So we just kept the momentum going with that. Uh, I kept telling them, you know, going with right was making the right choice. Um, I think that we've shown that it was. So just a beautiful car. John and Bobby, Pat, and the whole group gave us an absolute weapon to deal with. Uh, this kid just keeps surprising me with it, right? In GT3 cars, it's all about the qualifying, and that was definitely him there. I just had to manage. So no, did everything we needed to, and now we got to go do it again tomorrow. Gentlemen, the top step in Pro-Am is yours. That's a special celebration right there. Those two are close friends and a potent pairing behind the wheel. They pick up a win in Pro-Am in their series debut. Fantastic stuff as we look here at the results. Provisional from race number one of the weekend, McAleer, Phil Garris. They win overall from pole. Skier and Adelson winners in Pro-Am.
Yeah, fantastic day, some great racing out there, good battles, and uh, we don't have to wait long to see the action resume here tomorrow. Strong start to the championship season, even if it wasn't a win for Colin Brown and George Kurtz, finishing third overall, second in class, and a great debut, Pedro Torres and Spencer Pompelli. Third in Pro-Am, fourth on the road for yeah. a team that's new to this level of Spencer racing. Spencer was absolutely flying, as was Daniel Morad, finishing further down the order, but that uh, TR3 Mercedes was really hooked up here today, and I believe he had the fastest lap of the race. Fantastic stuff from that group, a little further behind them. Bill Oberlin did fade a little bit late, but historically that we have seen the BMW struggle over the long run at this track, especially the older M6, but perhaps this is not the strongest venue for that car, and Chandler Hull certainly looked like all the work he's put in in the offseason paid off during his stint, and he'll get to bring it home tomorrow. Yeah, strong Three points. I mean, they had a win, eight podiums last year, and they start off with P2. They're going to be happy. Uh, they love to win. Auburn's a winner, and uh, Chandler Hull's getting that same mantra as well. Taking a look at the podium, and there are your AM-Class winners. Running on a pose this weekend, more AM-Class cars anticipated in future rounds, Anthony Bartone and the legend that is Andy Pilgrim, British by birth, but uh, has been living stateside for a few decades now. Now we see the Pro-Am podium joining the two Am-Class guys, and Pompelli on the right, Torres on the left, third place in the Pro-Am class. There's George Kurtz, second in class, teaming up with Longtime coach Colin Brown. And those two look like they're ready to mount another championship challenge, but they might have to go through these two, even if they are new to racing together at this level. Adam Adelson and Elliot Skier put in quite a performance today. They didn't miss a beat. Nope. Uh, so impressive. Uh, you know, drivers who have so little GT3 experience, just basically test time, no race time. So really, really impressive. We talk about that in context with Adam because he's the M in the lineup and experience, building that experience is so important. But he's leaning on Elliot, who is not exactly full of GT3 no. experiences himself. No, not at all. So uh, got a great group there, there. John Wright and Wright Motorsports are going to lead them in the right direction. Well, let's take a look at the highlights from our first race of the season for Fanatec GT World Challenge America, powered by AWS from the pole. There was Eric Filgaris grabbing the lead right away. Adelson slotted right in in line. Pretty clean start, all things considered, through motion of the pack. Here was a little spin from Charlie Luck that put the sister right motorsports car behind the eight ball. It did. Then we saw a little battle off pit lane. Oberlin grabs that position, but had to give it back. There was overlap there. You see him. Uh, then Elliott skier by, then this was a great battle here. Daniel Morad, what a move down in turn seven. Does the over under here on Spencer Pompelli. And he was off on the attack, now chasing after Adam Carroll. Yeah, that was actually on Ross Gunn right there. Here is Pompelli though. He was very much in the fight today. Took him a little while, but that was a big move up the inside of Bill Oberlin. Not for class position, but it did set him up for a great run to the class podium. The checkered flag waved above Sonoma Raceway, and it was a beautiful start for RS1. Their championship campaign begins with a win.